Get ready. Genesis Dutch. 16-bit arcade graphics. You can't go this on Nintendo. Genesis Dutch. 16-bit sports action. You can't go this on Nintendo. Genesis Dutch. Genesis Dutch. Genesis Dutch. Genesis Dutch. Genesis Dutch. Hello and welcome to the 62nd episode of the Sega Bit Swing and Report Show. I'm Barry. With me is George. Hello. And on today's episode, we are going to be joined very shortly by Sega of America's former president and CEO between 1990 and 1996, Mr. Tom Kalinske. And he's the star of Blake J. Harris's book, Console Wars, which uh, you can order now. It's been out for uh, about a week. We actually had Blake on last week on the release date of his book. And the week before that, we had Al Nilsson, the former head of marketing for Sega, um, from 1989 to, I believe, 1994. Um, so it's been a busy week for it's us. It's been a very busy week. And uh, we, we have, actually, this isn't the end with Tom, even though we haven't even started uh, speaking to him yet. But uh, we do have some other shows uh, in the works. But uh, to to reveal that would be telling. And we don't want to reveal things, right? That's right. Plus, we don't want to set ourselves up for failure. You never want to do that. But um, I also wanted to make mention, too, that we are going to have some representation at E3 for the third year in the row. Um, we're going to have Knuckles and Shigs. They're going to be uh, running around playing stuff like Bayonetta 2, Sonic Boom, assuming they uh, have a playable copy on the floor. I'm pretty sure they will. Um, and whatever other games they announce, which uh, I'm not, we're not exactly sure when they're going to announce them. So we'll see. Yeah. But, um, yeah, so let's actually, let's give Tom a call and uh, get him on the line. How's that sound? Sounds good. All right, let's do it. Hi, Barry and George. I'm Tom. Hi, Tom. Well, I wanted to thank you so much for joining us. It's really an honor. Well, thank you. It's, it's my pleasure. I love talking about... Uh, about Sega and the, the team that we had then. Um, well, I guess to kick things off, I wanted to know, um, what what were your first thoughts when Blake, Blake reached out to you? Were you aware early on that you would end up being the main character of, of this book that he was writing? No, I, I, re I really had no idea. And I, and I think I remember exactly what I said to him when I first talked to him and he told me he wanted to do a book on on the the battle between Sega and Nintendo and the starting in 1990 I I said to him I said Blake there's probably only 200 people in the world that are interested in that and most of them either worked at Sega or Nintendo and he said no 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 you're wrong there's a whole generation of people that are interested in it so that's how our conversation started and it actually took him uh some some chatting to convince me that this was really a, a, a an idea where there were people interested in it and of course, he he ended up convincing me, and uh, mm -hmm. uh, I didn't know I was going to be the uh, the so called protagonist in the book. I had no idea. He's a he's a very nice guy, very convincing. <laughs> it's uh, I, I can see how he could have uh, sweet talked you into speaking with him. And you guys really, uh, it sounds like you really started a friendship over the years. Um, you've been talking a lot. Would, how much would you say you talked to him on average when you were? Uh, oh my gosh. <laughs> Uh, we talked uh, incessantly for w weeks, b basically both both in New York City. I'm here in New York City. I'm actually going to see Blake tonight. Oh, awesome! And and uh, and of course, back in my home in in Northern California, uh, he came out several times, and we spent hours and hours together. Uh, my wife and I, and his uh, uh, fiance, uh, recent fiance, Katie. And, and I had dinner, uh, you know, at, at, in, overlooking the bay once in a very lovely evening. And so we, we just spent a lot of time talking about those days. And, of course, I would bring up, gee, you got to talk to this person and that person and that person. And, I, and then he'd surprise me with all the people that he'd already talked to. So it was um, it's been good. I would say we have a very good respect for one another. And, uh, yes, we are now friends, I think. That's important, especially for a book like this, where it, I, I was surprised by how um, personal the book actually got with um, uh, just including your family and some friends and uh, some, some really sad stories, too. Um, but uh, yes. 
Yeah, and I, I did want to talk a little bit about that, too, but um, George actually wanted to uh, get into your early days in the industry. George? Yeah, um, you used to uh, work in the toy industry. What attracted you to the toy industry? That's a great question. Um, so long, long ago, I was working on the Flintstones vitamins business, and uh, sometime in the late 60s, early 70s, my mind isn't... Uh, thinking clearly right now. Um, but anyway, there was a Senate subcommittee on children's advertising, and at the time, they were, they were, uh, the senators were upset about cereal companies advertising cereals that had a lot of sugar in them, and they were concerned about products that were advertised directly to children. They were concerned about toys being advertised directly to children. And so everybody was in Washington, D.C. to appear before a Senate subcommittee, and it was the toy industry, the cereal industry, and I was there, Flintstones Vitamins. We were advertising directly to kids in those days. Yabba dabba doo, yabba dabba doo, Flintstones Vitamins are good to chew. And we'd show a child climbing a mountain next to Fred Flintstone uh, or doing something equally uh, adventurous. And uh, Senator Margaret Chase Smith was really giving the cereal guys a bad time and the toy guys a bad time. And, and she turned and pointed to me. And if you've ever been in a Senate subcommittee, it's not a lot of fun. They sit up on these desks generally that are nice mahogany things way up high, and you're down on a Formica desk with a folding chair with your lawyer next to you. And she pointed down at me and she said, So, Mr. Kalinsky, you think selling drugs to children is a good idea? And I said, Well, Senator Chase, I beg to differ with you, but Flintstones vitamins are actually a nutritious supplement that. Uh, that children need. I'm sure you're aware that 43% of America's children at this time aren't getting proper nutrition in their diet, and they really need a supplemental vitamin and mineral uh, 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 product so that they can get the proper nutrition. And by the way, I have letters here from moms thanking me because it's the only way they could get proper vitamins and minerals into their kids. And let me read one of those letters to you, and I read a letter to her, and then I pulled out a mail sack, and I had about a 1,000 other letters in there. I said, would you like me to read some more? <laughs> He said, no, that's enough. And uh, I never was asked another question. Well, the Mattel guys thought that was pretty funny. And uh, afterward, they kind of corralled me and said, gee, we really, we'd really like to talk to you some more. And that kind of started uh, uh, an interview process with Mattel that, I, of course, was com completely unexpected. And uh, that's how I ended up at Mattel. Oh, wow. I was going to uh, – another part of the book – uh, there was a part where you walk into a, a matchbox factory, a bootleg one, and uh, would you say that was the most dangerous moment of your career? Oh no, no, <laughs> no! That was that was nothing. <laughs> that was nothing compared to uh, all the battles we went through at uh, Sega versus Nintendo, uh, as I'm sure you're aware, outlined in that in the Console Wars book. Yeah. Um, I'm curious, too, just even moving before uh, you even – when you were a kid, what kind of toys did you like? What, what were Tom's favorite toys? Oh, boy. I, I, my favorite toys were a Rector set. I loved a Rector set, uh, which was, you know, those steel beams and you put things together and you mm -hmm. could make a crane out of them or what have you. And I loved uh, dinky die-cast cars. And you probably don't remember those, but dinky was a brand. It was a British brand. And they would make – like one car, one new car every month, not a lot. And I collected them, and I would wait outside the local toy store for that month's shipment of new dinky toys to arrive, and I would, you know, they cost like 50 cents, and I would buy it. And I had this collection of, uh, of die-cast cars. Oh, wow. And I, I loved playing with my, my die-cast cars. And then I, I was a typical kid, you know, I had, tons of die-cast soldiers, and I'd make armies up and stuff like that. But uh, Rector Set was probably my favorite. Were you aware that there's actually a Sonic the Hedgehog branded Rector Set? I was not. Yeah, yeah. They have, um, I believe there are two or three sets, and they are um, Sonic's in a race car, and it includes Knuckles, and they have um, one is a track from Sonic 2, actually, the chemical plant, the second stage. And um, I believe the other one's based on the Casino Zone. 
in Sonic 2 as well. So oh it's, my gosh. I don't, I don't even know who owns Erector Set today. I know it used to be obviously an independent company, but then it was purchased by, oh gosh, it was purchased by uh, Carrera at one point, and then I think Ideal Toys, and I don't know who owns it today. I think it's actually a British company that makes things similar to Erector, and now they, uh, they release their same product here in the, the States, but they give it the Erector brand name. Wow, that's terrific. I'm glad you told me that. I have to buy it. And they're actually, I believe I've seen them discounted at places like Toys R Us. So um, now is the time to buy Sonic Erector sets. Okay, I'm (laughs) going to do that. (laughs) Um, George, you had a question about Mattel? Oh, yeah. um, You, uh, what was the difference between working, I mean, what lessons have you, did you take from Mattel and bring over to Sega? Well, I think this whole this whole concept of uh, of respect for creative process and as a business guy being able to work well with creative people, uh, designers and uh, and uh, advertising people and uh, art directors and what what have you to build a a brand and so I, I think that that basic concept that that Ruth Handler taught all of us when we were at Mattel this high of course she was married to a creative genius Elliot Handler created more toys than probably anybody in the world. Um, I think that was something that I learned very early in my career, and it stuck with me for a long time. And then the other thing that uh, that that we learned at Mattel was the uh, the necessity for for uh, being bold, being brave, and being bold. Uh, an example of that is Ruth Handler once. The company wasn't doing well in the early days, and she was one of the first to advertise. And she spent the entire net worth of the company on the Mickey Mouse television show to advertise uh, a couple of products in those days. And, of course, it it saved the company, but it was a very bold move. If it had not worked, the company would have gone under. That's definitely a lesson. (laughs) Um, Once you moved over to Sega, uh, do you have one project that you look back on and you're just, it's the proudest moment of your time there? Well, you know, people ask me that, but there were so many things that we did that I was proud of. And I, and I was actually, I'm more proud of this team we put together than I am of anything else, of any one project. I mean, we had this fantastic team of of great characters, and, and you met some of them in the book, but probably not all of them. Mm-hmm. But, uh, you know, I mean, the Al Nielsens, the Diane Farnassiers, the Ellen Beth Van Buskirks, the Pam Kellys, the Joe Millers, the Shinobu Toyotas, the Paul Rios, um, uh, the Bob Botches. I mean, this was a this was a great team of characters, and then the and then of course the Japanese side, uh, the the enigmatic Naka, and uh, on our side the the Ed Annunziata who pro- produced great games, and and so many so many others, Mike Latham. I mean, just the, a huge list of great characters, mm-hmm. and a great team that the likes of which has has not been put together in my opinion. Uh, by anybody else. So that's what I'm most proud of. When when do you think was the moment in time when all of you were just charging on all cylinders and you felt like you could just you guys could do anything? Oh, probably 1992. Mm. Uh, I think we were we were feeling pretty good. And then of course the launch of of Sonic 2 and doing all these wild things that people hadn't done before, you know, uh, getting a product to every store around the world on the same day, a monumental task. Uh, uh, I'm sure you're aware we that was the largest shipment that Emory Air Freight ever did yeah. in one night. And, uh, the, you know, the CEO of Emory Air Freight said, wow, nobody's ever tried to do anything like this before. Mm-hmm. <laughs> uh, you know, it was pretty spectacular. And then the marketing plan behind it and the promotion behind it and making it the, the number one uh, selling product. Uh, in video games for a long, long time. Of course, it's been surpassed now, but but uh, certainly that was a, a big deal and a big moment. Mm-hmm. Well, I can I can definitely say as a consumer, uh, I, I felt that uh, excitement from Sega at the time in '92. I actually I told Al this too. It's uh, you know, of course, it's hard for us as I was. Um, geez, how old was I in 1992? I was probably about eight. Um, <laughs> Uh, eight or seven. And, you know, of course, I wasn't aware of um, you or Al or any of the team at Sega um, outside of maybe watching uh, promotional videos and seeing these 
these older folks who not super old, you know what I mean? But um, out Pretty there, old. just uh, <laughs> old, old to me as an, a seven or eight year old at the time. Um, but really, you know, it was all about the console. It was all about the games. It was about the the characters. And so um, it's just, I think the greatest gift that Console Wars gave me after reading it is putting a, a face to the behind the scenes. It's not just you, you and Al and the team are not just uh, uh, Wikipedia entries anymore to me. You're actually, you know, f- full-blooded people with personalities and uh, ambition. And you guys just, um, it, it gives, I don't know, it gives me more of a grown-up perspective on the whole thing and also really um, makes me appreciate being a Sega fan just even more so than before. Well, that's great to hear. I, that really is, uh, that makes me feel very, very good to hear that. Thank you. And I wanted to thank you, too. You guys definitely made my Christmas in 1991. I told Al this, uh, I, I received the Sonic 1 bundle, and I think the main selling point was, it wasn't the price or anything, it was just the character itself, and seeing him on the box was just the coolest thing. So thank you so much for that. Uh, as a Sega fan, I want to thank you. Oh, well, that was that, was, that also was, uh, it was pretty great uh, to... You know, to, I was so pleased that we were able to lower the price and to get Sonic into the Genesis and get it in the hands of, of millions of, of players. So, anyway, it was a good day. And lowering the price, too, is actually, um, at least from, from what I got from the book, a little bane of contention between you and Sega of Japan. Would you say that uh, interactions between Sega of America and Sega of Japan, uh, how, how would you say they changed during your time as president over those six years? Well, you know, one of the things that I, I wasn't completely aware of, frankly, until the very end of my time at Sega was, uh, you know, I thought that I, I knew I got along very well with Nakayama-san and, uh, and uh, had a, a great relationship most of my time there with him. And he would basically let me, as he indicated he would do when he hired me, let me make the decisions for the United States. But when that started to change, I couldn't figure out why. And it took me some time to realize that there was this jealousy that had occurred between middle and upper management that reported to Nakayama-san in Japan and me. I wasn't aware of it, but they apparently, his style was he would walk into meetings and uh, for years berate them over not being as successful in Japan as we were in the United States with Genesis and with Sonic and with a number of other characters and with the industry in general. And of course, if you're sitting over there and you're getting berated by the boss week after week, pretty soon you stop stop liking those guys in the U.S. Yeah. <laughs> and I just wasn't aware of that. Uh, and clearly over time that changed uh, his ability to, uh, to, to go along with me on decisions. And that's where we started, uh, uh, you know, I started getting told what to do as opposed to this is what I want to do and them agreeing with it. I was being told what to do. And that changed the relationship uh, pretty dramatically toward mm-hmm. the end of my time there. And, of course, you know, you left in 1996, and um, how, how involved were you with Sega after that? Are, are you aware of maybe how um, modern technology has helped uh, the relationship at the company? I know some of the community managers um, currently employed, they, they go over to Japan and they, they hang out with the staff. It seems like a lot more friendly than it was in the past. Well, I hope so. I, I hope both sides have, have learned how to manage that situation better. But honestly, I, after I left, I was so busy on other activities. I did not stay up to speed on what was going on at, at Sega. I was a little bit involved for a while with the Sega Foundation mm-hmm. and uh, in charitable activities. And, of course, the, one of the unmentioned characters, at least I don't think we mentioned him very much, in the, or he was mentioned very much in the book, was Mr. Okawa. I was the largest shareholder of Sega, and he ran the CSK Corporation in Japan, and he was an absolutely wonderful man. I mean, I, you, you can't, I can't say enough good things about this guy. And he was actually Nakayama's boss. And uh, uh, he had me involved in some of his foundation work after I left Sega as well. Uh, but other than that, I was not aware of what was going on between uh, Sega of America and Sega of Japan, or for that matter, how Sega was proceeding with its marketing of, uh, of the, the follow-on systems or, or with games. So I really was out of it. Robot Nick has disrupted Swing and Report Show Communications. Reconnecting in three, two, one. 
Hi. Hey, Tom. That's all right. Um, I'm sorry. That's all right. I'll just add you back on, and we'll we'll clean up the audio. It's no problem. Um, okay. I did want to ask you. Uh, you mentioned the Sega Foundation, and um, one of the more touching sides to the book was your um, your friendship with a family, uh, specifically a girl named Anique. Yes. Um, did Did you want to talk at all about that? It's uh, it's it's surprisingly um, personal for for a book of this scale, for a story of this scale. But uh, would you say that's really what drove you to create? Um, more of these uh, outreach efforts and also, I guess, even uh, inspire you to take education and technology as kind of your future career? Well, I think, uh, first of all, I I believed in doing the Sega Foundation just so that we could, uh, you know, help, you know, we were making a lot of money. Let's give a little bit of it back to help kids uh, with health issues and with education issues. And so we started the foundation uh, first. And then when uh, Al came to me with the story about, uh, gee, no major corporation would have anything to do with pediatric AIDS, I thought that was nuts. I mean, I know this sounds crazy, but back in those days, corporations were afraid to have the word AIDS associated with their corporate name. And uh, and here we had pediatric AIDS, which was, you know, these poor kids, they generally got it through a blood transfusion at a hospital. Uh, unknowingly, obviously, the parents didn't know the kids needed a blood transfusion shortly after birth, and they ended up getting uh, getting AIDS. And uh, what the heck are we going to do about that? And so I knew Anique. I knew her family. They lived uh, when I lived in LA. They had lived down the street from me. Of course, by then I was up in Northern California. Uh, but I thought I thought of her when I heard about pediatric AIDS needing funding. And, of course, wanted to, to help out. And uh, so she clearly was the reason why uh, I was so willing to do something to help about pediatric AIDS. But also it was the, it was the right thing. It was the right thing to do. Mm-hmm. And, uh, you know, years have passed, and now they have drugs that can actually keep those kids uh, uh, alive. They did not have those drugs back, back then. And, uh, unfortunately, a lot of kids uh, passed away uh, uh, from, from AIDS during that time period unfortunate it's um but um you know you guys did do a lot uh was that unique for the industry at the time i i'm not exactly sure the book goes into about how nintendo handled things but um yeah it was it was fairly unique um um Mattel actually after us, and and I was very close still, and I still am with many people at Mattel. It's kind of that's interesting because we're all, whereas I didn't stay close to a lot of Sega people, I stayed very close to a lot of Mattel people, and Mattel in in their foundation efforts also picked up later the the uh, the cry for helping pediatric AIDS, and and frankly probably donated a lot more money than we did at Sega. But I think, I'm pretty sure we were the first corporation to to get involved in that cause. Um, but anyway, you know, doing the right thing for for kids in education was was part of the foundation, and I'm glad I'm glad we did it. We did a lot more than than pediatric AIDS, but it was a, it was certainly the right thing to do. Your question on whether that was what got me interested in education, uh, not a, not really. What really got me interested in education was when I saw how video game technology could absolutely uh, you know, enchant uh, kids and teens and mm-hmm. any college kids, and and keep them involved and interacting with it. I thought, why can't we use this in education and make education more interesting? And of course, one of the products at Sega we launched was Pico, the kids' first computer, mm-hmm. which really did that. And it, but no, it was for very young children. Whereas the rest of our audience was teens and up, Pico was clearly designed for the just learning to read age and it was books that came alive on your on your tv screen and a stylus when you you know when you touched a word it came alive on your tv screen and and and, and frankly i used it i used that same technology uh, to a great degree when i was at leapfrog Mm -hmm. with the very first leap pad which was not a tablet it was a device that you put printed books on top of and with a stylus you could get the word phonetically pronounced or get a picture to come alive and talk to you, et cetera. So that's what got me into education as much as anything else. Mm. You actually answered one of our later questions about the Pico, um, and I do want to get further into it uh, later on. Um, 
But yeah, the Pico was a really, really amazing piece of hardware. It even came through in the book when you saw it for the first time. The Pico always kind of resurfaced for a few a few sentences and it would go away. It wasn't the focus of the book, but it definitely um, had an impact on you just as a whole. As well, a it, had a, it had a huge impact on me because one of the things, I mean, I remember very clearly, we were selling something like a... It, it, we were selling like a hundred million dollars worth of, of Pico product in the United States. It was, you know, that's sizable. And yet the board back in Japan said, what the hell are you doing this for? You could just do another game, do another Sonic game and you'll do more than a hundred million and it'll have a higher margin. And of course that's true. And the, kind of a light bulb went on in my head, and I thought to myself, you know, it's going to be really hard for any entertainment-based company to attack education because it's true. Doing entertainment will generally always be more profitable than doing education. So if you're going to do education, you probably have to be an education company devoted just to doing that and not an entertainment company where off to the side you do a little bit of education. That yeah, that does make a lot of sense. Um, you so the Pico. Would you say that was a success in the United States? Well, I think it was a success in the to the degree that the market embraced it. It was not a success in terms of we could never get the hardware price correct and make money on the hardware. We did make money on on the software, but it was. Uh, it was, you know, people loved it and it was successful. But again, it's one of those things where we were basically told to stop doing it because it wasn't uh, it wasn't profitable enough. Mm. Do you, are you aware of all uh, how the Pico did in Japan? I know it actually had a very long lifespan and even a um, successor, the the Pico Bina. Yeah. Oh no, I'm very much aware of that. In in Japan, it was highly. Uh, you know, they did different versions of it. As you said, the Bina version was kind of a, a slimmed down version, uh, a more advanced version. And I think they did a lot of work in the chipset to get the cost down. And it's, it continued for years. It yeah. continued up through, uh, well, it may still be going today. I don't know. But it continued up through. Last time I saw it, it was maybe four years ago over there, and it was still successful. They also had a relationship with the Benesse Corporation over there, and Benesse, of course, is one of the largest education companies in the world, and I think that helped them quite a bit. Mm. I actually impulse bought a uh, recent uh, uh, Pico purchase. It was actually a Donald Duck fishing game from, I think, the uh, early 2000s. It's, it just blows my mind that you can there, are, there were Pico things being produced at that time, especially really strange things like going fishing with Donald Duck. <laughs> on the Sega Pico, but uh, my dad's actually visiting this weekend. I'm gonna. He's a big Donald Duck fan, so I'm gonna surprise him with a a fishing trip on the Pico. <laughs> <laughs> That's great, um, George. You did have a question about uh, the European side of things. Oh yeah. Um, did you, Tom? Did you have any control over the European hardware or software releases? Well, over software, we had some control, and remember, we were. We were doing a lot, quite a bit of software in the U.S. for the U.K. and, and, and you know, clearly the obviously the Sonic 2 launch was a, a international launch. It was certainly a European launch as well. But we also uh, did uh, the FIFA f- soccer game and uh, other products that were successful in the European marketplace. We didn't have any control over over Mega Drive there, but. Uh, we certainly provided them with an awful lot of, of software, and I think we had a very good relationship uh, uh, with with uh, the guys in the UK. Hmm. Uh, what was your uh, what's your thoughts on the the add on they released in the UK, the Sega Channel? Do you remember that? Well, we did the Sega Channel in the US. Oh, is it the US? Uh, yeah, I must, I must be incorrect. Sorry. <laughs> so, so the the this is it was really an interesting time. Uh, so I we had, we had this idea, uh, and I you know like usual these things you're sitting around brainstorming, and this might have been a Doug Glenn original idea actually I'm not sure, but we were talking about uh, how can we get 
uh, set top boxes to accept video games and, uh, and, and get them into the hands and do some kind of a subscription service through all the different cable providers so, they'd be, so they could more easily play a variety of games at a, at a reasonable price. So we're talking about subscription service. We're talking about downloading to cable boxes. Still, it sounds easy. So we did a deal with, with Time Warner initially. And one day I'm sitting in my office and I get a call from somebody at, who worked directly for John Malone at TCI. And I don't know if you know, but John Malone is, you know, billionaire many times over, a very powerful guy. And he usually gets his way. And this guy called up and said, hey, we hear you're doing a, a, a Sega channel with Time Warner. You can't do that with them alone. You've got to include us. We've got coverage over another 30 percent of the U.S. And you've got to include us in the deal. Mm-hmm. And these guys had a reputation for being kind of tough. And, and he said he's coming over like the next day. And sure enough, he did. And I don't remember his name. But anyway, we ended up, uh, I called Time Warner and I said, gee, TCI wants in on our deal. And, uh, and I think maybe we better get them in because we'll have better coverage over the U.S. And they agreed. So we did this three-way uh, partnership. Here's the issue, though. What we didn't know was every every set-top box in those days, every cable box in every major city seemed to be a little bit different than the next city. So Atlanta's was different than Boston's, was different than Chicago's, was different than Los Angeles's, was different than San Francisco's. And it was really hard to get them all to work. And we had rooms of these boxes and TVs hooked up and testing like crazy. Well, anyway, we eventually got it working in most of the cities, and it was for $15 or something. Uh, the memory capability was such that you could only download – you'd get a selection of, of 25, 30 games, but you could only download uh, maybe six uh, and, and, uh, and have those available to play. So it was somewhat limited in that regard. But if, you're, if you think about it, back in that era, that was really something to try. Mm-hmm. And I think we got up to about 150,000 subscribers so, you know, it was a it was a pretty good effort. It wasn't good enough to have it continue, but it was a pretty good first effort, I think. That seems very much like the Sega spirit uh, in going into some sort of innovation like that. And, you know, even if it doesn't completely succeed, it definitely sp- spurred, uh, you know, later. I mean, you can play games in hotel rooms now via phone connections and things like that. Yeah. Really fascinating yeah. stuff. Yeah, I mean, in a way, it was very much like the like the CD-ROM uh, uh, effort that we did. Uh, it was a first. It was necessary. If we hadn't done it, I think it would have taken the industry many years more to figure out how to either do a Sega channel, a uh, game channel on like, in hotel rooms, or to do uh, optical disc media for games. So, anyway... <laughs> It'd be interesting if Blake's next book was a fiction. It was what if Sega didn't exist and what would happen to the industry. <laughs> uh, I have to tell him that. <laughs> uh, George, you had a Sonic question. Oh, uh, what was the moment, Tom, that you knew that Sonic the Hedgehog was going to be a major success for Sega? Great question. Um, you know, it was kind of funny. I'm sure you know that. Uh, uh, there were people inside Sega of America who, who really didn't think Sonic was going to be successful. And I was kind of, I would say at the beginning, looking at a blue hedgehog, pretty neutral. But I do recall, you know, when, coming from the industry I came from, you have to try new and different things. And sometimes the crazier and more outlandish they are, the more likely they are to succeed. So I sort of had that in my mind. And then the other the other thing was uh, we were making these changes. I mean, the original Sonic, as you know, we felt was was unacceptable to the U.S. market, uh, along you know, with his fangs and his very sharp spikes and his his uh, his aggressive, uh, ferocious attitude and his girlfriend with Madonna with her boobs hanging out. And you know, so we had to change we had to change all that, but. Once we did that, I would say that the minute I knew it was going to be successful was the first time I actually saw the gameplay. I mean, I had never seen anything like this, and I don't think anybody else had either. The speed with which uh, they were able to move the character and, uh, and, and, and his, his, his attitude. You know, I liked what they had done. I liked it wasn't ferocious anymore. It was kind of smart-ass. 
Mm-hmm. And and I like that a lot. You know, a lot of our cartoon characters in the U.S. have been a little way next door. They got an attitude, and clearly he had one, and I thought that was appropriate. Uh, similar to Spider-Man, actually. I always equated Sonic's attitude with the uh, old Spider-Man kind yeah. of uh, model. Right. Um, Tom, I did have a question. Also, speaking about Sonic, um, you guys not only had him in games, but there were also there was also a successful comic series, which is still sold to this day, as well as a couple TV shows. How involved were you with um, Archie Comics and with Deke to create these things? Well, I was very involved because you know, again, coming from the industry I came from, that's what you do. You you license once you create a brand, you license it out into other areas to expand the media reach. And to get that character uh, in front of consumers in different ways. So comic books was a natural. But even more important than that, the TV shows were really important. And I don't know if you're aware of this, but when I was at Mattel, I was the guy who did the Masters of the Universe television Mm -hmm. show. And it was the first time a television show had been based on a toy character as opposed to the other way around. There's lots of toys based on television shows or movies, but it was the first time that a television show had been done that was based on a, a toy character. And, of course, the, the the world went a little crazy over that. That experience really gave me the, the uh, and, and I did many others after it. I did Princess of Power and a whole bunch of other ones But while I was at Mattel. But when I got to Sega and we had Sonic underway, I really wanted to have a television show. And so my dream was just to have one television show, but we ended up, we were, we ended up up with both a network television show that was on every Saturday morning and then a different television show that was uh, that we did with uh, with Deke that was that was every afternoon and I generally and in the markets it occurred at about four in the afternoon so that show is still running you know I run I get to a lot of places in this country where in the afternoon there's still a Sonic the Hedgehog television show on yeah, it's wild. It's still in syndication. Still it's still on. in syndication. Yeah, and what was the reasoning for two? Uh, Al told us because Mario got one, and Sonic gets two. But <laughs> I wanted to know if you can if you can agree with that. Or not. Uh, oh, I, I would never disagree with Al. Ha ha ha. <laughs> but but uh, no, I mean it was basically it was so successful that uh, the you know the, we really were pursued to do an afternoon show and I had known the I've known the deep guys for forever uh, much like I've known Haim Saban and some of these other guys in Hollywood forever and so it, it was a, a natural thing for us to do and and why not you know why not extend the the brand even more uh, and uh, and get it uh, in front of more consumers in that manner I'm anxious to see what they do I hear they're doing a new one yes sonic boom it's actually um Kind of bringing it more back to the game's roots, though um, it's also going to be kind of original in its own right. Uh, they're putting sports tape on the characters. They've got a little more athleticism to them. Um, uh, Robotnik or Eggman, he's more of a Baron kind of type, or a, it looks like he's in a fly, flyboy kind of suit, uh, 1920s kind of uh, situation. I'm not exactly sure how it's going to turn out, but we're going to actually find out in a few weeks uh, yeah. at E3. So yeah, that's going to be exciting. Good. Well, last year I went to E3, and of course, I it, it, it startled me to see uh, Mario and Sonic in games together. I mean, I <laughs> honestly had not noticed that. Did they have to pick you up off the floor? Uh, well, just about, just about. <laughs> and I went into the uh, Nintendo booth, and I played Sonic against Mario, and I'm pleased to tell you that I beat the demonstrator nice. So with, with Sonic. So I was very happy about that. <laughs> Well, that's, that's that's the final. Uh, we've decided then. Sonic's better than Mario. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> um, d- during the towards the end of your time at Sega, um, you know there was the the Saturn. Um, what I know things didn't exactly work out the way you wanted them to. Um, what would have been your ideal approach for transitioning from the Genesis to the Saturn? And do you believe the 32X would have been implemented at all, or would it have been? Uh, I guess that's that's the question I'm. Yeah, and you know, I, first of all, I I think it's pretty well documented. I wasn't crazy about the Saturn platform in terms of how it as a next step up platform. Mm. Uh, I wanted it to be better and a bigger step up in technology than than what was delivered. 
And so it, and I, and I tried my darndest to, to get, uh, as I think, you know, I think it was documented in the book, an arrangement with, with Sony where yes. together we would do one platform and that platform, whatever, whether it was called the Sega so- Sony platform or the Sony Sega platform or whatever, that would be the hardware platform in each company. And we'd lose money on it or, or break even, hopefully. But we'd make profit off of our software. And, of course, in those days, we were much better at software than Sony. So I thought this was the greatest deal in the world. And Sony Japan agreed to it and Sega Japan did it. Mm-hmm. So that would have been the ideal situation for me. The, yeah. the, if I had my way... Do Genesis, keep it alive as long as you can, longer than we did under the scenario that actually occurred, and then move to a Sega Sony platform. And I think that would have just been wonderful. But that's not what happened. And so in the interim, I was trying to keep uh, Genesis alive with uh, 32X, and that didn't work because we frankly didn't have enough good games for it. And we didn't get uh, enough support for it from from either Japan or from third parties. And then the Saturn, uh, the only way to launch a platform, and I, so I've already made it clear it wasn't the platform I really wanted to launch. But you got to have a lot of great product if you're going to launch it. You can't launch it with just a little bit of software. Mm-hmm. And uh, I was forced, I was ordered to, to launch it at uh, that day. And, you know, we had to scramble and make plans so we didn't have enough hardware, we didn't have enough software, so we could only ship hardware to a couple of retailers that annoyed every other retailer, as you can imagine. And uh, it was really, that was sort of the end. You know, for mm-hmm. me, that was that was pretty much the end. I knew I had to go do something else because it wasn't the way I wanted to, uh, uh, to market or run a business. Uh, uh, and so, anyway, that's... The sad part of the history, I guess. Yeah. Um, what of the Sega Nomad? Was that? Um, do, do you have anything to share on that? I know it came out in October of 1995, and at uh, North America only, I believe. Yes. Well, it was the combined device. You mean? And the, um, the the portable Sega portable, Genesis. Yeah, it was portable, a uh, portable screen, so you could play the 16-bit games on it, but you also could connect it to a television, and it would run the games on a larger screen as well. Mm-hmm. And so. Uh, you know, that was another, I was desperate to try to keep Genesis alive. I wanted to keep Genesis alive for longer than, than, uh, occurred. And, uh, so anyway, that was the hope with, uh, with, with Nomad. Mm. Well, I, I, I will, still have one, by the way. I do too. <laughs> <laughs> and I will attest that, um, you know, well, uh, Sega kind of shifted over to the Saturn. I, I really did not get into the Saturn. I played my Genesis up until 1999 when the Dreamcast came out. So, there, there was some power to the system. I think it had, it definitely had potential. Yeah, it had legs beyond which uh, it was given the t- time to run on. And I'm, you know, I still uh, probably, as you would guess, I still have a Genesis or two in my basement, and I have a whole lot of games. <laughs> <laughs> what is your favorite game? <laughs> oh, my favorite is still Sonic Two. Uh, but there's, you know, I, I like some of the sports games we did, even though of course today the sports games are so realistic. Uh, when I see my son playing a sports game, sometimes I think he's actually watching a football game or a basketball game, but you know, I still like the things we did back then. George, you had a question about uh, planets. I, well, before I get to that one, I wanted to ask him what, uh, revision, uh, or which version of the Sega Genesis do you like the best? There's three released in the U S yeah. That's a good question. Um, I'm trying to think what we called each version. And I think the one we released in 94 was probably my favorite, but uh, it was a little slimmer. Um, anyway, I can't yeah. remember. Is that the Genesis Model 2 or the Model? Th- I believe the Model 3 was with uh, another company. Yeah, no, Mo- Model 3 was with um, was it Jesco. Tish- or Majesca. No, that was that was not us. No, no, no it was Model 2. Model, Model 2. 2. Yeah. yeah. That's probably the most popular version of the Genesis, I would say. Yeah. 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 Um, oh, talking about planets. Um, <laughs> you guys uh, had popular code names for Sega consoles. And uh, is it true that the Game Gear was called uh, Mercury, the code name? Honestly, I don't remember any longer. Um, when I... 
you know, I, I saw Game Gear almost right away at, when I went over to uh, Japan, and I mm-hmm. fell in love with it. I loved the idea of a color screen handheld portable device. And I don't recall if we called it Mercury or not. I know we very quickly picked on the name. Uh, we, obviously, we had Game Boy as a competition, so Game Gear seemed like a, a logical name. To, to We had another number of different versions of names I know we, we thought about. But I think that came about pretty quickly uh, in the in the development of it. So, uh, what was your like uh, thoughts on the whole launching the uh, the Game Gear? Because when I was a kid, I owned a Game Gear, and uh, the only issue I would have with it was probably the battery life, like everybody else. But you should see people's faces when you show them a color uh, a backlit color screen; they get they get big smiles on their faces. Oh yeah, I mean I and I agree with you. I mean I, we kept trying to get that damn battery life issue uh, resolved, but uh, it just chewed up a lot of energy in running those color games. So there wasn't a whole lot uh, early on we could do about it. But I loved I loved the Game Gear and I loved comparing it to Game Boy. And one of my favorite commercials of all time was when we used, by the way, I had an Airedale dog. I, I guess you're aware of that. And uh, so we used an Airedale. Oh. It wasn't mine, but we used an Airedale in that commercial where we we talked about, we showed all the different uh, games that we had on Game Gear, and we compared it to Game Boy with its black and white screen, and we kind of said in, you know, at the end of it, uh, uh, unless you're a dog and can't see, see color, you know, uh, Game, Game Gear would be the product for you and showed the dog drinking out of the toilet. That, by the way, got a big rise out of... Uh, it was one of the one of the several times that uh, that Nintendo sent a cease and desist lo- a letter to us. Oh, wow. <laughs> and that, that commercial was Tom's dog, I believe. <laughs> well, it would look exactly like my dog, but it actually wasn't my dog. But, but the, I, had a do- I had a dog like it, yeah. The title of the commercial, I believe. Oh, yeah, Tom's dog, yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah. Yeah, and uh, and of course we love getting the cease and desist orders because we knew then we had really done our job. That's great. Definitely in the Sonic the Hedgehog sort of uh, spirit, thumbing your nose at the competition, but yeah. being playful of it. Uh, George, do you have another? another oh question? yeah, I was going to say, uh, do you remember the Sega Jupiter, which is supposed to be an unreleased console you guys were working on? Yeah, vaguely, vaguely I do, um, and I, boy, I'll tell you. I can't remember what was the reason for not doing that. Mm. Uh, anyway, and then there was the other episode where we were thinking of using the chip set that, uh, that Silicon Graphics had developed. And Jim Clark, the founder of Netscape, before he was at Netscape, he was the chairman of Silicon Graphics. And he had called me up and he had this guy working for him who later became the founder of NVIDIA and uh, said, hey, we got this great chip set. We think it would make a great video game platform and we went out and looked at it and Joe Miller and I thought it was terrific and we invited uh, the Sega hardware team over and they looked at it and poo-pooed it and of course it became the next uh, Nintendo system. (laughs) (laughs) Oh, I was going to... Had Sega Genesis not inter- interfered with uh, the Sega Genesis? I mean, if they didn't, uh, if Sega of Japan, Sega Japan. didn't uh, interfere with the Sega Genesis Twilight Years, do you think that uh, Sega of America would have had a complete control of the Sega Saturn launch? Or I don't even know what this question is supposed to say. <laughs> this was actually a reader submitted question. Uh, actually, I had a little trouble wrapping my head around it, but um, uh, I think basically it's asking if. Um, if Sega of America had complete control, do you, Tom, believe that you guys maybe would have uh, been maybe stronger following with the Dreamcast and further on? It's a, it's a, it's a kind of a big question to ask, yeah. I guess. Well, it's it's a hard because it's a hard question because you know a lot of things would have to happen. I think if we had been able to keep the team together, and if we had been able to develop better games. Uh, for whether it was Saturn or I was not involved in the Dreamcast at, at all, basically. But if we had, if we had been able to do better games for either of those systems and and launch them with the right games, or probably delay their launch. Um, yeah, I think we could have been more successful than 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 they were. But I think the key is you had to have the right people involved too. And and uh, you know, at one point we had the right people. At another point, uh, you know, a lot of them. We're gone, and, and of course I was gone too. So, uh, 
uh, you know, I don't want to, I don't even know, I don't really don't know the guys who succeeded us that well. So, mm. but I sure had a great team. That's all I know. <laughs> um, Tom, uh, what was your opinion on Nintendo before joining Sega, and uh, has that changed now after working with Sega? <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, actually, I don't know if this was mentioned. Oh, yeah, it was mentioned in the book. I actually had an experience of working with Nintendo when I was CEO of Matchbox, and we did a Matchbox uh, game uh, for the Nintendo system, and I remember basically getting... Uh, very little time for approval of the game by Nintendo. They didn't treat their third-party publishers very well. We were then a third-party publisher. Uh, they told us how many we could get. Uh, they basically controlled the situation very, very tightly. And it, it didn't give me a good taste for working with Nintendo. Let's just put it that way. And so when I when I got to Sega and I learned how they also not only did they control their third party publishers very tightly and a lot of them were upset over it, they also controlled Retail America very tightly and, and a lot of the retailers were getting upset over that where, you know, they would they they couldn't get the shipments they wanted on either hardware or software uh, in the quantities they wanted. And so there was a lot of uh, a lot of people that were hoping someone would come and take Nintendo down a notch or two. And I think we certainly eventually did that. <laughs> this is uh, George's favorite question. George. Uh... Oh, if you, could, if you could go back and change one thing during your time at Sega, what would you change? Oh, yeah. Well, clearly, as I talked earlier, uh, the one thing would be I'd get Sega Japan to agree to doing the Sony Sega hardware system. Mm. And because we had such a great relationship with Sony in the United States and we were doing such good software in those days, I think that would have been the, the market would be completely different today. It yeah. would be completely different there. It would be a, uh, you know, a very powerful Sega still and Sony and who knows what would have happened to Nintendo and, uh, and Microsoft, but it would have been a completely different marketplace today. Have, have you heard, um, I think it's beyond rumors now, it's actually fact that after the Dreamcast discontinued, Microsoft approached Sega with the uh, potential to have a chip in the Xbox to play Dreamcast games. Have you heard of this? Uh, I, I heard that rumor, but as I said, after I left, I pretty much kind of closed oh, yeah. the door there, and I was just heads down working on other companies. Understandable, definitely. Uh, George, this oh, is the big question. <laughs> Uh, Console Wars is being developed into a movie, and uh, if you had to choose one actor to play you, who would it be? Oh, boy, I, I'm afraid to fall into that trap. I mean, if I say somebody, for sure it won't be that person. You know that, right? Yeah, I know uh, that. That's why I think this is, a, this is what they're trying to do here. Yeah, I, I mean, I, I know that Al had that same question asked him, and, and Al uh, Al's a pretty large, funny guy, and... Uh, and everybody thinks that Seth Rogen would be the perfect Al, but I'm not sure who would be the perfect me. Uh, I'm not going to answer that one. As long as he's as he's younger than I am now. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> How about George Clooney? He's too old. Too oh. old. No. Yeah. No, well, it's Leonardo be DiCaprio. Younger. <laughs> Remember, I was I was only in my 40s back, early 40s back then. It's gonna be it's gonna be a real wild ride, you know that. Once the the movie gets going, yeah, yeah. <laughs> are you prepared, or are you gonna run off to an island somewhere? So, oh no, no, I'm I'm looking forward to it. And 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 you know, uh, Seth Rogen and Evan Goldberg are such good writers uh, uh, for screenplays and, and movies and directors. Who who knows what they're gonna come up with? I'm sure it'll be entertaining. Absolutely, uh, George. Did you have any more questions? No, that's all the questions I have written down. Did you well, that's ask good, because I, I actually have to run. I've got uh, I've got my daughter uh, coming over here, and uh, we've got to go run and do something before we do, go do a uh, a uh, book signing 
at a mm. art gallery with Blake tonight. Oh wow, what I wouldn't give for an autograph book. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, we'll have to get you one. Jeez, <laughs> get well, me your address. <laughs> I, I will. I definitely okay. will. <laughs> All right, uh, Tom. Well, I want to thank you so much. It's been a real pleasure talking with you, and I'm I'm proud that you were the president of uh, one of my favorite companies during probably my favorite years of that company. Uh, it's well, just I'm. Been- Go ahead. Oh, it's just been a delight to talk to you. That's well, all. thank you. And I'm proud to have been uh, CEO of Sega of America, too, during that time period. And as I said, very proud of the, the folks that we had there. A great team. Wow. Well, thank you so much again. And we would love to have you on in the future. Thank um, you, Tom. Perhaps. Yeah, thank you. And Well, thank you, guys. Thanks, George. Thanks, Barry. All right. You take bye-bye. care and say hi to Blake for us. I will. All right. Bye-bye. Thanks, guys, for joining us. On the... Are you still recording? Yeah, I'm still recording. <laughs> yeah, oh, okay. reco- it just records automatically until I put stop, and I haven't put stop. All right, well, I'm just going to say, well, thanks. Thanks to Tom for joining us. It was a real pleasure. And also thanks to everyone who followed our, I guess you'd call it the Console Wars trilogy. We had Al, we had Blake, and uh, we battled the final boss, that is uh, Tom Kalinske, though I don't think there was much battling involved. It was more us gushing as fanboys. But, um... He's a really cool guy, don't you agree, George? Yeah, he's pretty good. He's a pretty cool guy. So Leonardo DiCaprio <laughs> playing him? You, you know, I what? was just thinking Wolf of Wall Street. That's what I had on my mind. But I don't think Tom's the same as uh, yeah. I was that, gonna say that movie's sure, pretty but... <laughs> that movie's pretty graphic. But it, it doesn't matter who he picks. I mean, because at the end of the day, everybody's gonna be like, oh, even if he does like a great performance and wins a an Emmy or whatever, he's gonna yeah. be like, that's not even me. Yeah, that's true. That's true. I'm looking forward to the uh, the whole console wars onslaught. It's going to be a while from now. I also wanted to end the show um, with a little. Uh, I don't know if you saw the news that actually broke while we were sitting here. Summer of Sonic is not occurring this year. It is not happening. Oh man! Uh, yeah, ho- I never. Been however, to one. Sonic Boom is happening, and it's not happening in California. It's happening in New York City, Saturday, October fourth. 2014 at the Grand Ballroom at Manhattan Center. Are you going to go this year, Barry? That's the question. Well, I mean, uh, hopefully no one from my work is listening to this, but, um, you know, we're looking to move to Chicago eventually, so I re- now I hope I uh, at least stick around uh, the uh, this side of the country until October, because I would love to go to Sonic Boom dressed as Amy Rose. Of course. Uh, in the... With my hammer. I was gonna, yeah, I was going to say, if I lived in the East Coast, I'd show up as Big the Cat. Big deal, dude. <laughs> well, you know, even if I even if I am in Chicago by that point, which maybe happened, I don't know. I I, I don't know. I might make the drive or the flight. I, I really want to go to a Sonic boom. I kind of wanted to go, too, but everybody online is very negative about it. Yeah, let them. Let yeah, let them be negative. I guess. Let them be negative. Let all the let all the gushers and fanboys show up. Let the negative Nancy stay at home. Yeah, and, <laughs> and uh, what do they what do they call that thing with with your finger? I I don't know. iPhones. I'm trying to do this. Uh, I'm sorry. I'm oh, trying the to loser. Do the I'm doing it with my finger right now, but you can't. The shape me, of an L on finger. your forehead. Right? Sorry, sorry about that. Now the the listeners will be like, what's up? I was All right. just singing Smash Mouth. All right. Well, thanks to everyone for listening. Thank you for Tom for coming on. And we, uh, we're we going to take a little break from the show. I'm going to be traveling. I'm going to be in Chicago uh, next week. But we will be back. We will uh, do an E3 episode. Uh, that's the plan during E3. Am I going have... to be on that episode? I, I was never told if I was going to be on that episode. It's up to you. It's up I to you. I would like to be on that episode. I like to bitch at Knuckles <laughs> and Shigs. Uh, <laughs> They'd be like, yeah, yeah, I didn't play as Sonic. I played as uh, Amy Rose the whole time. We're like, why? <laughs> what? Uh, no. But, um, yeah, and then after that, we actually have some other uh, uh, shows in the works, but I don't want to spoil them because uh, the competition is listening, George. Always. And we have to be like console wars, and we have to battle them. I don't so. think it's that dramatic, but no, I don't think it is either. It's more like it's more like me sitting in my underwear, looking at my iPhone, going, "Oh man!" All right, bye, guys. Bye. Time to choose a Flintstones vitamin, Chris. Mmm, I'll take Barney. Hey, Chris! <laughs> Glad you could make it. Wow, it's you and Fred! 
Yep, la, la, the most la, 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 famous la, la, men <laughs> in bedrock history are carved out of this mountain. And here we are at the foot of Mount Rockmore. Let's get climbing. yabba da ba doo yabba da ba doo Flintstone Spider-Man's are good to chew. yabba da ba doo they're good to chew. Ooh, I'm slipping. I got you, Barney. Thanks. Ooh, that was close. Come on, Barney, we're almost there. You know, Mom, just one Flintstone each day gives kids all the vitamins they normally need to take. When they don't eat right. Ah, shoo! What was that? Yikes, let's get out of here! Run for your life! Chris, you'll be late for school. Yabba-dabba-doo! Yabba-dabba-doo, they're good to chew! 